All right, I am Rob, I'm from Coordinates. We're a geospatial data management platform and we're trying to crack GIS data out of vendor silos. So you can host, manage, share, publish, access and build apps on top of data. And we really make it easy for professional Mac anglers to find and access geospatial data and get on with their jobs. And that's making decisions, building maps, creating models, developing applications. And on the flip side, we help facilitate publishing data. Um, what I want to talk about today, though, is versioning. So how many people kind of consider themselves a developer or spend some time developing software? So quite a lot. And besides having to try and make computers do what you want all day, you're pretty lucky. Uh, you can actively work across multiple tasks and projects and switch between them. You can have different um, development and release branches. You can do things like code reviews and pull requests so that your colleagues can uh, collaborate across it. And this, this is what makes open source work as well, right? That we can collaborate efficiently with people who aren't uh, in, in larger groups and who aren't necessarily all together. And a developer can take for granted that they can always see who changed what and when, and if they're really lucky, why. And developers use these sorts of things every day, but, but in respect to data and geospatial data, you just can't do this. And we talk to our users, and they say we want this, and so that's what we're trying to do. And we have some more opportunities as well, right? And so uh, we talk about working between different ecosystems is really important in geospatial. So we have our open source ecosystem with projects we love, like PostGIS and QGIS. Uh, we have people and colleagues and customers and suppliers who work in uh, the ESRI ecosystem, uh, or maybe the application, like the web developers, and they don't really do geospatial data. And so in the engineering world, they work in CAD, all these different ecosystems are a little bit disjointed, and when we go between them, we often have to convert data, and our expectations are different. If you're a, a government agency publishing data, you will do it in your uh, national grid, because that's, that's what you do. But whoever's using the data might want it in something completely different. And every time we have to do these conversions, it adds, adds friction to getting updates. We can also do things like uh, data integrity and being able to verify that I have the same thing as you is really important. And looking at uh, what I've written here is like supply chains. And so um, I get data from somebody else, and maybe other people get data from me, and how do we see where this data has come from? So what are we trying to do with CART? So CART is uh, built on Git. Uh, we decided to focus our effort on data and geospatial, and we can leverage other people who are in the, in the software world who focus on the, the underlying building blocks that, that we're using as part of Git. We want to maintain compatibility, so, so CART should be familiar to anyone who's a developer, but it, it won't necessarily be identical. We want to make it easy to install, uh, so we include all the batteries, and it works on uh, Windows and Linux and MacOS. Coordinate system handling works. Database connections work. We, tr we try and make it work out of the box. And we want to make it for practical day-to-day -day use. So this isn't really a solution for people who have their own satellite clusters producing terabytes of data every few hours. They have software teams, and they can develop tools specific to them. This is for the rest of us. So I'm going to do a very quick demo now. I'm going to look at what a cart repo actually is, and then we're going to have a look at making some changes. So what we've got here is uh, QGIS. And if we look up on the left-hand side, then we can see our data browser, and we can see some layers that have been added. And from QGIS's perspective, a cart repository is is just a geo package or just a directory with some images in. But, let's get my mouse cursor. Okay, 
But what we can do is uh, make some changes to these things, and then we can look at history. So uh, over here, we've we found a problem with our data. And uh, what we're going to do is like select it. I'm going to say, who added this weird island thing? I'm going to go select it over here. And then we're going to delete it. So let's see, delete keywords. I'm going to edit first. This is really hard on a giant screen. Wrong layer, of course. There we go. Hey, oh, come on. You can do it. Yeah, delete it. Okay, so we can uh, save our changes in QGIS. And so we'll see what happens next. From QGIS's perspective, this is just a layer, right? So uh, over here, we can uh, go to. Uh, our repository. Now let's have a look at what our repository is. And so I've cloned this from a workshop that we did earlier in the week. Uh, and so we've got a few files here. We've just got our geo package, .g package. We've got a terrain directory, which has uh, some uh, tiffs in. And we have a VRT file that cart automatically generates. And what we can do now is just do cart status. And Kat can tell us that da -da 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 -da, uh, one, one uh, delete has happened, and we can uh, commit it. OK, so we've made a change to our repository. And that's, that's great. We can also see what the history is. So we can see that um, I've deleted a change. So that was my most recent change. And then Hamish maybe made some changes a few days ago, which might have been uh, adding that. And we can go back through time, kind of see what changed, and we can view differences as well. So I'm going to go on and talk about our um, cart plugin, our QGIS plugin a little bit later on. But that, that's a really easy introduction to some of the underlying building blocks. So we try and build on top of existing file formats. So in this case, our what we're working with here is a geo package and, and some TIFF files. And if you're in a different ecosystem, if you work in the ESRI world, it would just be a file geo database. Or if you're working in a CAD world, not that we have it yet, but uh, DWG files and stuff. So I talked about our vector and table data sets we support. And so uh, we have kind of 0 to 100 gig, which is pretty big. And uh, we try and follow a SQL model. So we have a schema, and you can change your schema over time. And that's OK. But you kind of have to assign data types and columns. And we, we pull in all this stuff. And we input from many OGR formats. We know about coordinate systems. And one of the cool things that we can do is re-import from a snapshot. So if somebody sends you files every few uh, weeks or every few months, you can keep loading it into the same repository. And you build up a history of versions that you can then compare and see what's changed. We support point cloud data. And uh, we build our point cloud data support on cloud-optimized point cloud. And I'll talk a little bit about that a bit later on. And again, it's kind of 0 to terabyte size data sets. And we do things like use the brand new support for creating uh, virtual point cloud files so that uh, from QGIS's perspective, you can just open the data set, and all the tiles are treated as one tile for styling and uh, performance purposes. We now support rasters as well, and that's built on top of cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs. And for both point clouds and rasters, we, we don't store the data itself in the repository. It lives in um, like an object storage system, like S3 or something else. And the reason we do that is to enable um, what's stored in the repository itself is the information about the tiles. So where they are, what the coordinate system is, how many bands they have, maybe some statistics. And then it allows CART to uh, selectively um, alter stuff without having to, to make big duplicate copies. And one of the things that we're going to be able to do soon is to be able to point CART repositories at object stores that already exist. 
So you don't have to copy your data into Calc. So we have this concept of working copies. And that's where you work and edit your data. So before, when we were in QGIS, we saw that we had a geo package file, we had a directory, and we have different, uh, different working copy formats for, for different places. So you can put data from your cat repository straight into Postgres, and we'll keep updating it as you switch around between branches and revisions. Uh, you can do the same thing with Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, um, I already talked about Esri, and we've started using the cloud optimized formats for um, point clouds and rasters. And the idea is you can, we can start serving tiles and uh, stack and other things from the repositories. But being able to do a, any revision back through the history of all the changes. Uh, we've got a cart QGIS plugin. And the QGIS plugin is the panel you can see on the right. And that allows you to uh, navigate the history of the uh, repository. It allows you to make commits from within QGIS. You can roll back. You can switch branches. So you can do this sort of stuff um, natively from within QGIS without having to use the command line. Something else we support is spatially filtered clones. And what we're doing here is working only with your area of interest. And so if I'm a data publisher, I have a, a national data set, that's how I want to publish my data, right? But if I'm a, a, a local user working in a specific city or town, that's probably the only area that I'm interested in. And I shouldn't have to either work with a, a much larger data set that has lots of information that's not relevant to me, but at the same time, I shouldn't have to divorce myself from that data set. So what we try and do with spatially filtered uh, clones and, and working with spatial filters is to be able to stay part of the larger repository, including all its history, uh, editing, updates. But what you're actually working with locally on a day-to-day -day basis is just a, a filtered view of that. And so when I make changes, I'm pushing and pulling to the full data set. Uh, but when I open it up in my software, in, in my Postgres, or in my QGIS, then I only see the, the area that's kind of relevant for me. And so this is obviously something that uh, we've built that isn't really relevant to, to Git or something else. And so this is what I mean about we can focus on features like this that are important to our users rather than uh, kind of reinventing um, parts of Git that that other people have already done. And so I've got a small demo of that. We'll see if we can um, make this work. So what I'm going to do here is uh, clone a data set. If you're a Git user, you kind of recognize what I'm doing. This is the point where you're like, I didn't realize I was going to be holding a microphone, so I'm like one finger typing a really long repository name. Now, this is a USGS point cloud data set. And we're going to hit the button, and it's going to clone down. And the first thing it does is collect all the information about all the tiles in the point cloud data set. And then it kind of figures out what it needs. And so what it's going to do is go away and, and figure out that it needs to transfer quite a lot. I think it's about 10 gig, 146 files. This is never going to work. It's OK. We have spatial filtering to the rescue. So I can uh, specify a spatial filter when I'm pulling a clone down. And we can do it uh, in different coordinate systems. We can do it as WKT. We can do it as firewalls. 
So in this case, I've got some WKT in a file that defines a little box. And, whoops. Uh, where am I? Okay. So I'll put it back up there. So I added a spatial filter, and it's doing exactly the same thing it did before. But instead of pulling down 146 files or whatever I decided, it's going to just grab two, maybe three. And this is going to go a bit quicker. And the Wi-Fi is working. This is great. And so you can imagine for um, like a national or continental size data set, this is going to make a huge difference. So uh, let's go. Go into here. So each data, each data set for point clouds and rasters is a directory. And in this case, it's the Agua Blanca fault in Mexico. And we can see that uh, we have three COPC layers files, and uh, we have a VPC. And so, given that spatial filter, um, it's decided that that's the only thing that's relevant to to the area I want. And so, cuts just pulled down the data it needs. And we can go into QGIS. And we will go into our folder. Maybe I can move that away. And we've got a. Um, I'm going to create a new project because it's going to be a. Something different. And we can, uh, it knows about CRS. We're going to set the project CRS from that. We can create a 3D view. There we go. And as we zoom in, uh, we can. Uh, QGIS will now quite happily load the tiles um, incrementally. We can do all our QGIS stuff, and we're working with a smaller subset of the larger data set. The really cool thing about VPC, and the same with VRT, is that, and really good work to Hobu and the Lutra guys for, for adding it, is that we can keep, uh, from from the desktop perspective, we're working with one layer in QGIS, and Cart can update it in the background. If you change your filter, it will pull down some more data or throw away some data. Um, but from QGIS's perspective, we can treat it as one thing for styling and, and stuff. Let's get back here. So I guess what's coming up in the last year, we've uh, been steadily trucking away. I said we added raster support. Uh, point clouds were very, very new last year. Uh, we finished off a bunch of work around documentation. Uh, we now have much better help on the command line. Uh, the tools is faster, generally. Uh, we fixed a lot of bugs, and we're kind of making steady releases with uh, new capabilities and uh, just general improvements. So I talked about before, we want to reference data from existing S3 buckets without copying. So if you have a, a S3 bucket with lots of cloud geotiffs in, uh, what we want to be able to do soon is just point your repository at those tiles, and you can treat it as a cut repository. We already submit multiple data sets in a repository. So these are four uh, basically different layers and different tables. And you can add in, uh, obviously, rasters and, and point clouds as well, and keeping them together as a project. But what we really want to get to is looking at interlinking data sets from projects, because often um, the data you're coming from is coming from different suppliers. The data you're getting is coming from different suppliers. And so we want to interlink it so that you can have a nice, compact project repository with the layers you're interested in, regardless of where they came from, and to be able to pull in updates from where, from other repositories really simply and easily. We know how to do that, and we just uh, need to build it out. We want to be able to blend local and remote raster and point cloud data sets. So if you've got data that's, um, as I said, like a national uh, raster layer, 
you might want to have some tiles locally because it makes your day-to-day -day life a lot quicker and easier. You can uh, run analysis or do models on them for the relevant areas, but maybe you want to be able to at least see the other data sets uh, by pulling them directly from the cloud as well. And we want to be able to serve tiles and APIs like Stack directly from repositories and supporting all the history, right? So that we can look at different tags, we can look at different branches and uh, different commits in this history and treat it all sensibly uh, via Stack and tiles.